Well, welcome. It's Sunday morning again, and it's a beautiful day. And this morning, we're going to talk about the most precious thing you could ever receive, and that's redemption. And you may, you may be listening today, and you've been a Christian for years, and you're going to go, oh, redemption, click. No, don't click. Don't, don't turn it off, because there's things you're going to find out this morning that will help you with your walk and help you to walk in freedom. And if you're listening and you've, you know, never committed to Christ or don't really understand redemption, well, you will after this morning. And uh, we're going to have a good time getting into this. We're going to start off in 1 Peter 1, verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So, we, and, and God wants to emphasize we were not bought with silver or gold or, or you can never work enough to make enough or put enough good works aside to pay for your redemption because the price that was put on it was the blood of a spotless lamb, the blood of a sinless man, which was Jesus Christ. And so there's no way, God wants to make sure we understand that your value, you are valuable and and you were enslaved. You know, redemption talks of uh, buying back a slave, someone that was enslaved. And so you were enslaved to sin. You were enslaved to the devil. And then God purchased you. And the price that he put, he said, there wasn't enough silver, wasn't enough gold to buy you back. That's, if you want to know your self-worth this morning, you need to understand God is, the, you know, in real estate, <laughs> the value of a home, it goes by what somebody's willing to pay for it. And that's why you can go to some countries. We, we go to New Zealand, where is our head office, and you look at a home there, and they're going like, this home is like 1 million, 1.1 million. And you're like, in Canada, that's like a $200,000 home. Well, in Canada, that's what somebody's willing to pay for it. But in New Zealand, somebody's willing to pay $1.1 million. And uh, it's almost getting to that point in Moncton now. We're seeing the price of home skyrocket because people are coming and buying up property. Well, your value is not set by what the world tells you. Your value is not set by what you even think. It is worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. And the king of heaven was willing to pay the blood of his only son. And so you're, you're, you're invaluable. You're, you're, praise God. Stop putting yourself down. And so that is the price that was put to buy you back was his own son dying for you. And so we are not saved or we are not redeemed by works. We're going to see that this morning. We're not redeemed by how much good we can do. You know, if we could get redeemed If we could redeem ourselves, if we could get redeemed by purchasing ourselves, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to die for us. But but we can't. And uh, we used to sing an old song, uh, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away, you know. And and I I just spoke it. I didn't sing it, if you notice, because singing's not my thing. That's the worship team's thing. Anyway, and so there's this price that had to be paid for us to be redeemed. In Ephesians 2, starting at verse 1, it says, And you he had quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now listen. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
or that you could say I saved myself. No, I had nothing to do with my salvation except accepting it. I didn't work for it. I wasn't worthy of it. I didn't do enough good things for it. No, Jesus paid fully for it. I was enslaved and he came and bought me. So if he redeemed me from being a slave, then I'm now his. And that's why we say all the time, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. My life is not my own. I, I don't know about you, but my life before Christ was horrible. And in, and in addictions, in all that was happening. And so I owe him my life. So every day of my life, I'm just thankful that he saved me. I'm thankful that I'm alive. I'm thankful that I'm blessed. I'm thankful I will do whatever he asked me to do. I will go wherever he asked me to go because my life is not my own. And so it's so important we understand this. But we've been purchased... And we've been taken out of darkness, brought into light. We've been taken out of the dominion of a madman, Satan. And we've been brought into the dominion of God who loves us and cares for us. But here's the thing. A lot of times we carry stuff over. We carry stuff over from that old life. We carry stuff over from over there. And, and we, allow, we allow that enemy to still operate in our lives. We allow things that he did to us to be done to us again. And uh, I want to talk about that as I was praying this week. God spoke two things to me. He said, you're going to talk on redemption. And then all of a sudden, he just says these words. He says, you're also going to talk about Stockholm Syndrome. And I was like, okay, I know a little bit about that. And so I went and looked it up. And Stockholm Syndrome, it says, it is a psychological sickness. So it's in the mind. It is a mind that has been, um, it's, it's been worked on. It's been uh, fashioned and formed by an oppressor. And so their thinking is wrong. You get somebody with Stockholm Syndrome, they'll say that of abused wives, that their husband will hit them and beat them, and then they'll, they'll still go back and be faithful to them. Uh, I've, I've heard my brother-in-law's a Maori, and he went to try to help a woman that was being beat by, by her husband, and, sh and when he grabbed him, she turned around and hit the Maori, hit him, because she was so conditioned in her mind to believe that that husband, that she deserved what she had, and it was her fault, and she had, she had an allegiance to him. She and so Stockholm Syndrome can happen to Christians because you got born again. You got, you got redeemed from an oppressor, but then that oppressor comes back, and then you, your mind's been conditioned to believe that oppressor. Your mind's been conditioned to even have empathy for that, and, and all of a sudden, that oppressor comes and puts sickness back on you and tells you it's your fault that you have the sickness because you'll hear this all the time from abusers. It's your fault that I hit you. If you would have shut your mouth, if you would have not done that, I wouldn't have hit you. It's your fault. And then, and then you, after a while, you begin to believe that it is your fault that you're being oppressed. And so, so many Christians, you hear them say, well, God's just trying to teach me something from this. God has nothing to do with sickness and disease. That is not how he teaches us. That is the oppressor convincing you that that is what it is, but it's not. Or, or Oh, it's my fault. I, I, I'm, you know, it's my fault that I got sickness because I didn't do everything right. Listen, if you're in outright disobedience to God, yes, you will open the door for the enemy. But listen to me now. Sickness didn't come on you because you didn't do everything right. That's like saying, well, you got hit because you, you shouldn't have said that. Well, no, the person shouldn't be hitting you. And sickness doesn't belong to you. It is from the oppressor. Sickness has come to oppress. It's come to harm you. And it is part of being enslaved. It's part of Egypt. Doesn't belong to you. Just like this plague that's going in the land right now doesn't belong to us. There's no way that I'm going to receive symptoms of COVID or be, or be diagnosed with that. When my Bible says, no plague will come nigh my dwelling for he's put angels around me to surround me and protect me and my household. 
Praise God. And so I'm not receiving that. That's from the oppressor. I am not receiving that. That doesn't belong to me. I have been redeemed from living under that lifestyle. See, when you lived as a slave, you had to work for the oppressor, and the oppressor did whatever he wanted to you. But once you've been redeemed, he has no more claim to you. Come on, somebody. He has no more right to you, and everything from his kingdom has no more right over you because you've been redeemed. doesn't belong to you. So, but we, but, but I'm telling you, people have Stockholm Syndrome. They still, they still think that things from back there that, that can still have dominion over them. And it can't. It can't. It really can't. And so we have to be freed from the psychological or mindset, right? We have to be freed from the mindset of our former life. We have to be freed from the mindset of the slave. Come on. You are no longer a slave to sin. That means addictions have no power over you anymore. Come on. Sickness has no power over you. Poverty and lack has no power over you anymore. Why? You've been redeemed from that. And now you've been, you, we just read it, you've been seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, far above principality, sick, sickness and disease, uh, wickedness from high places. None of it has authority or power over you unless you let it. You know, there's a proverb that says the dog has gone back to its vomit and the sow has gone back to its miry clay because... The mindset was still there, and so you have to get redeemed in your mind. See, okay, well, let, let, let's just go here. Philippians 2, verse 12, says this. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I used to read that, and coming from a coming from a background where I was taught that we were saved by our works, I'm reading that and I'm saying, well, that's saying that we are to, there's works. And, but what Paul is really saying is, you need to take the works of salvation and apply. You have a part to play in this. You have to take what you've been redeemed from and you need to get that mindset gone and have a new mindset. You need to now have the mindset of salvation and you need to apply the work of salvation to your life. And so you have to now apply what salvation has provided for me, what my redemption has provided for me. I now have to apply that to my life. Because here's the thing. Your, your spirit has been saved and born again, but your mind and your body haven't. And so in your spirit lives all the work of salvation fully. The Bible says the Godhead dwelleth fully in you once you got born again. And so the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all the work of redemption and all the work of salvation is at work in your spirit. But now your mind and your flesh have to line up. And so that's why that we are spirit beings and we have to operate from our spirit. And with our spirit, we are to change our mind. And when we change our mind, it'll change our body. So the work of salvation comes from my spirit through my mind into my body. Did you get that? <laughs> we are not body, soul, and spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. You were body, soul, and spirit when you were living under the enemy's camp, but now it's been reversed and now you are, your spirits become alive now with the life of Christ and now you are spirit, soul, and body. So with my spirit, man, I speak to my soul, I change my mindset, and it changes who I am. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so there is a, a change, a transformation that has to happen. Praise God. And so I apply the work of salvation to my life so that I can walk in the fullness of what redemption has done for me. So I can get rid of sickness. I can get rid of poverty. I can get rid of addictions. I can get rid of all the things that would enslave me and bring me back under a captor that has already had to let go of me when I was redeemed. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't quit. He, he wants you to be, I mean, you were his slave for years. He, he, wants, he wants you, you know, and, uh, but he doesn't have the right to you unless you give him that right. So you got to get rid of Stockholm Syndrome. 
Do you hear me? You got to get rid of that. You got to get rid of the mindset that's still with the enemy or the enslaver or the captor. You got to get rid of that and change it to a mind of freedom, to a mind of he will never touch me again, not fearing that he'll come back because he can't unless you let him. In 3 John 2, it says this, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as or to the same amount that your soul, your mind, and your heart prospers. And so as your mind and your heart prospers or begins to be enlightened by the word of God, then you will prosper financially and physically in your health. Some people say, oh, that's all spiritual. No, that first word. Uh, I wish in all things that you may as prosper, look it up. It is financial prosperity, financial freedom. God wants you free financially. Doesn't mean you have to be a millionaire, but you can't be bound by poverty or bound by mammon or money. It can't be always on your mind and what consumes you. No, money's just a tool that you use to pay bills and to bless others. That's all that it is. Money should never have your heart or your mind. I, I look at money. I can have money in my pocket. And if God says, give it to somebody, I just go and give it. It means nothing to me. It's just a tool that I use. You know, sure, I get I, I get excited if a bunch of money's coming to me. Anybody would, because then you start thinking, what am I going to But I don't live for that. I live for God. And he provides all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And my mind's been renewed to that, that everything I have is his. And so it doesn't belong to me. It's no big deal. And so as we, as we change our mind, our lives change. Because your spirit's already been born again, but your mind hasn't and your body hasn't. And so as you allow, again, what we are doing is working out our own salvation. Taking what sal salvation is what the word says. Salvation is what the word says is yours. And so once you begin to renew your mind with the word of God, now I am changing my mind from being set with my captor to being set with my deliverer. Woo! Praise God. And so I'm getting rid of Stockholm Syndrome by setting my mind on the one who is my deliverer, not on my captor. And it's a process. I said it's a process. I mean, some of you were captive for a long time. I was captive for 25 years of my life. And probably more than that because there were still areas I was still captive after I got born again. And so it's a process, and it's a non-ending process, because he doesn't give up. He comes and he throws darts. He comes and he tries to get you back. If he can't have your life, your whole life, he'll try to get parts of it. If he can make you sick, if he can make you broke, if he can make you down, if he can make you depressed, if he can captivate any area of your life, that's what he's after. And so you have to constantly be on guard. The Bible says the enemy is as a roaring lion roaming to and fro, seeing whom he may devour or whom he may be a captive over again. And so you have to constantly fill yourself with the word of God so that he cannot devour you. Remember, he can only devour you when you're in the realm of the flesh, when you operate from the flesh. Amen. I've got one more verse. Same as the first. <laughs> and it's Romans 12, 2. Oh, this is a powerful one. Oh, this is good. Do not be conformed to this world. Meaning, under the captive. This world, the Bible says that he is the prince of the power of the air, but he is also the God of this world. And so, do not be conformed, or do not be fashioned and formed by this world's way of thinking. Because that's how you were before, remember? We, we read that, just a few second verse, same as the first, remember? And so, do not let your mind be fashioned and formed by this world's way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transform is metamorpho. It is a metamorphosis. It is going into the cocoon as a caterpillar that crawls on the ground and lives on the earth to a butterfly that flies in the air or soars or that is seated above 
everything else. And so God says the Word of God has the power to take you from operating in the realm of the flesh, from operating in the realm of the ground, which is where the devil devours. It can take you from there and cause you to fly where he can't touch you. <laughs> Think about it. In Genesis, when the snake, when the serpent tempted Eve, what did God say? He said, from this moment forward, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat of the dust of the earth and what it contains. Go read it. It's what it says. And so when you are operating as a caterpillar in the dust, that's where he devours. But when you metamorphosis and you metaf and change into a butterfly and now you're flying, now you're not operating down there, you're operating up here. He can't touch you there because God told him he couldn't devour up here. So when he goes to and fro seeking whom he may devour and you are up here as a butterfly, whoo! He can't devour. He can't make you sick. He can't make you broke. He can't make you down. He can't make you depressed because you're operating in a level, in a place where he can't touch it because now he is no longer your oppressor because you are under the kingdom of the one that has redeemed you. Praise God. Why did he do all this? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Woo! That people can look at you and see what the will of God is. Because people say, prayer, it drives me when people say prayer like, Oh God, if it be thy will, heal me. Well, what does the word have to say about healing? Nowhere can you find where somebody went to Jesus and said, Would you heal me? That he said, Nah, it's not my will for you. You look sketchy. I don't know if I like you. No! Every single time that they went, you look in the Bible, every time they went to Jesus looking for healing, he healed them. Every time. The leper, the blind, come on. Everybody. The dead were raised, praise God. He didn't discriminate against anybody. He raised them from the dead. He healed them. And I want to tell you, he wants to heal you. He wants to set you free this morning. If you're sitting watching this broadcast this morning and you're dealing with addiction to drugs, I want to tell you there's one that paid to redeem you and he wants to set you free right where you are. I see you right now in your living room. You're so depressed you can barely look up. You're on pills. You're on everything. It's, it's prescription pills but it's still an addiction. I want to tell you, God wants to set you free right now, right in your living, right on your couch, right? It's a green couch. Right now, he wants to set you free right now in Jesus' name. Let us know when he does. Let us know. I never want to close a broadcast without giving you the opportunity this morning. You've listened to all this, and maybe you've never made a commitment. You know, the blood of Jesus is there to save us. But we have a part to play in it. We saw Paul said, you know, it's not by our works, but we do have to receive what you've done for us. And so Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you confess him as Lord, you will be saved. And so this morning, if you're listening and you've never confessed him as your Lord, you've never asked him to forgive you of your past and to be your Lord, I want to give you that opportunity. And I want to pray with you. We're going to pray together right now. Heavenly Father, forgive me. I believe Jesus died and rose again for my sins, for my past. From this day forward, I will serve you with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've just prayed that prayer, we want to welcome you into the kingdom of God. We're excited for you. If you're in the Moncton area, come and see us. We're here 1030 Sunday morning. If you live outside of Moncton, find a good church and go to church next Sunday. God bless you.